switch screen. You got it. Now, can you see my screen? My yeah, time? looking okay. good. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, anyhow, thanks, Paul, uh, for the, the nice introduction and uh, for the um, the fun to talk about some of these uh, exciting things that are going on. Um, I I was not involved in the discovery of uh, Oumuamua or or the most of the research that's um, in in the press right now. I got interested in it a little bit later as it um, uh, intersected some of my my strong interests in Pluto, and you'll see how that comes about uh, in a few minutes. So, um, uh, if if you don't know about Oumuamua, I give you just a little bit of background so if we can get this to work. So it's um, it was discovered um, in October 2017 uh, by the the University of Hawaii's PanStars telescope. And this is a telescope that searches for asteroids and comets, in particular, uh, near-Earth objects, objects um, like asteroids in orbits that cross that of the Earth and that um, could eventually hit the Earth. Um, it, it was originally classified as a comet, um, but no observations showed uh, cometary activity. And I'll show you an image. It shows that it was just a, a, a pinpoint of light. Um, also, very soon after its discovery, it was realized that, that its orbit was hyperbolic, that it was moving at such a high speed that it, it could not possibly be cap, uh, captured or gravitationally bound object of, of the sun. Um, and after a few sort of odd interpretations of, of the object, it was reclassified as an asteroid, uh, although now um, it's back to being a comet, and I'll show you a little bit about how that came about. But the, the biggest mystery uh, was its its characteristics, or is its uh, various char characteristics. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data which indicates that it's uh, highly elongated, a bit like a needle, about 10 times as long as it is wide. That kind of aspect ratio is just completely unknown in our solar system. We don't find asteroids with aspect ratios of any more than three to one, and those are small and, and they're, they're rare. Uh, it has a uh, sort of a convoluted surface um, that is very, very shiny, and I'll show you uh, that in a moment. It has a reddish color, which is very similar to objects in our outer solar system that we believe have been uh, subject to cosmic ray uh, 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 impacts. For, for billions of years. And so that that kind of makes sense. Uh, the Another thing that kind of struck uh, the observers is that, it, it, that with the careful, deep observations, it was found to be completely inert with, with no hint of dust or, or, or gas around it, which uh, for a comet, you know, that's sort of a, a contraindicator. Comet should have, if at least as we get, they're getting close to the sun, they should have, have um, uh, gas and dust coming off. And, and none ha has been discovered uh, at, uh, by any of the studies. None, no gas or dust has been discovered coming off of it. So it, it's, a, it, it's important, whatever it is, as the, the first clearly interstellar object that's been discovered for our solar system. Um, it, it's, and it, the we, we know, and I'll show you why, we, we, we know from our understanding of the way solar systems form that there should be lots of interstellar objects, mostly comets. But it, it, it clearly is not a standard comet. And, you know, not just its aspect ratio and how shiny it is, but several things combined make it just downright bizarre and and I'll, although you don't see the word bizarre in the scientific literature you you do see it in the more popular literature so what i'm going to do is i'm going to talk about um uh, its characteristics um and and then i'm going to have a short detour sort of in the middle of that actually to talk about why um we expected and we do expect there to be lots of interstellar uh, debris from solar system formation and and readjustments um, now, more recently, uh, another, a second uh, interstellar object was dis discovered called uh, 2i Borisov, and it clearly 
looks like a comet. I, I mean, it walks like a comet, it talks like a comet, and so you know everybody thinks it's a comet. No, 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 no problems with that one. So we've got two objects clearly uh, that are visitors from outside our solar system that are very different. And so that has given rise to uh, at least a half a dozen different theories that purport to explain why uh, Oumuamua is, is so um, unusual, uh, while at the same time explaining uh, why we get one object that is exactly as expected. Well, not exactly, there's a few tidbits of, of data that make it a little bit different and, and interesting. So I'm gonna talk about some of the theories, not all of them, but a few of the theories have been put forward to, to explain uh, what's been seen or, or what these two objects, or how these two objects could have formed. Um, and then at the end, I'll just say a few minutes about what we can expect for the future. You know, more discoveries of these objects, which we need to sort of sort out what's going on. Um, possibility of a spacecraft mission to catch up with one of them. And um, uh, as I go through this, uh, I'm gonna even talk about um, uh, Joe Loeb's uh, uh, theory that uh, this is a technological artifact, um, which is a very interesting um, suggestion. I, I, and I don't think you can dismiss it out of hand, but we'll see what the evidence says towards the end. So that's what I plan to do. Um, so, Oumuamua, okay, the name, first of all. Uh, this was a name proposed by the discoverers, and it's from the Hawaiian, which, um, uh, in summary, it, it, it's, it's a word that stands for a uh, scout, uh, indicating a first visitor, messenger scout from distant regions to, care, to reach us and, and to carry a message. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the etiology there. It's there if you want it. I can give my slides to Paul and he can share this too if he likes. Uh, but, the, but the word is actually kind of nice because it is the, you know, the first visitor from outside of our solar system that we've clearly identified. And it's clearly carrying messages to us. Whether or not it's a scout, though, uh, is a different story. And, and I'm actually going to mention or say something about that towards the end of it, too. So what is, what is the data? What's the, the evidence? Okay, so this is um, one of the, 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 the images that Karen Meech, one of the co-discoverers of the object, has published. It's a very, very deep um, tracking image that shows Oumuamua at the center, the little dot there that doesn't move. And since it's tracking Oumuamua, the other objects uh, in the sky, the, whatever the stars uh, in, in the background, they show trails. Um, if you were... Um, uh, following the stars, then Oumuamua would show a, a trail. But this, I wanted to show this version of it because it, you can clearly see it's a point. It, it's, it shows no uh, smear, it shows no halo, no dust, and, and none of the observations showed anything like that. I mean, it, it looks like either a very distant comet, which it was not, it was within 2 AU of the, of the sun, uh, or an asteroid, uh, perhaps a, a, a very odd asteroid. When it was discovered, it was already uh, past perihelion and on its way out of the, the solar system. Um, and, and so uh, launching a spacecraft to, to catch up with it, it, it's not completely impossible, but it would be a, a, an enormous undertaking. Uh, for one thing, it's moving very, very fast, and you would have to catch something that's moving between 25 and 30 kilometers per second. That's not a trivial undertaking. Unfortunately, because it had already uh, started heading out of the solar system, it was getting distant, uh, more distant from the Earth on a day-by-day -day basis. And so there was a lot of urgency in, in studying it to try to get as much data as, as possible, as soon as possible. Um, I think I've, I've got a, uh, a plot at the end that shows its um, visual magnitude right now, which I think is somewhat like 34. Uh, so it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's hard to, to even study anymore. Um, and I don't know if you can see this. I, I'm, I hope it is this animation working. First of all, for you. Yeah, um, it looks good. Yeah, oh, looks good. Okay, good, good. So this, uh, I wanted to show this animation so that you can see the, the, that it's coming out of the ecliptic. You know, it, it, it shows no evidence at all as being one of the things that were formed 
uh, in the during the formation of the solar system. You know, the, the planets, the the comets, the asteroids, all that stuff were um, uh, formed, uh, co-rotating around the sun, more or less in a plane. And there were scattered objects after the formation, comets and protoplanets. Um, encountering the giant planets was scattered into somewhat of a spherical cloud like the, the Oort cloud. And I'll show you that in just a, in a minute as well. But it's it's clearly hyperbolic. It clearly is is not, uh, well, at least let me put it this way. At first blush, it's absolutely not a, a solar system object. And the speed alone means that it's um, hyperbolic. There's no way you can get an, uh, an object like this coming in from the Oort cloud because of the collision with another comet. Um, I suppose it might be possible if there was a passing star uh, in the Oort cloud that, that gave it a very high velocity, but, but comets and stars don't um, interact too nicely. And um, uh, star, stars almost always win out. Uh, so it would have to be a very odd uh, gravitational encounter to give something like this. Maybe not completely impossible, but not really a plausible thing. So this is a, clearly an internet, uh, interstellar visitor. Okay, so now's the detour. Uh, and and I, I wouldn't do this except that it, it's kind of necessary for the story. And, and this is um, sort of a one page, what is it? That sort of, it's a one page summary of how our solar system came to be. And I apologize to those of you who already know this stuff. Some of you may even know it better than I do. And, that, you know, that's, and I really apologize to, to those of you. But but the idea when when stars and planets form is that they, they originate in a giant um, molecular cloud, usually a very cold molecular cloud of only a few degrees Kelvin. And these giant molecular clouds might have 100,000 or more times the mass of the sun. So much mass that the self-gravity causes them to, to collapse. And as they collapse, they, um, they conserve energy, which causes it to heat up. They conserve momentum, which causes it to, to, to speed up in its rotation. And what you end up is with a flat uh, pancake-shaped uh, rotating object, uh, rotating very fast compared to the original giant molecular cloud, hot in the center, the mass in the center, and that gets hot enough that it initiates nuclear fusion. And um, the once the star forms, uh, that's about the time that the, that the stuff in the disk around it, let me say this, when the star starts nuclear fusion, that's about the time when the, the material around it is clumping together to form planets. You form like grains of condensed objects first and then pebbles and then boulders and then protoplanets and then they come together to form um uh you know regular planets like the inner planets the terrestrial planets and the giant planets and so on different classes of planets uh it's a violent process lots of collisions and there's evidence that that there that there were planetary scale collisions uh, throughout our solar system and even rearrangements but ultimately, you get the formation of, of uh, planets around the stars. And the debris that's left over, the, the protoplanets that were not accreted into planets, were, were then ejected out of the solar system, some of them to form the, the Kuiper belt, or at least the distant regions of the solar system, that's a Kuiper belt. And then the, uh, the Oort cloud, the cloud we have the, with the long period comets originate. Um, and then some of that stuff is actually thrown out of the solar system. And in fact, a lot of it is expected to be thrown out of the solar system. And so every solar system that forms, you, uh, I should say every planetary system that forms, you would expect a lot of debris, not just to be left in our solar system, like comets and asteroids and, and stuff like that, but stuff that's thrown in the interstellar medium. But the interstellar medium is, is, is huge and and so the the density is expected to be very low uh the fact that there's stuff there though doesn't surprise anyone um the nature of the stuff is expected to be comets and not asteroids and let me kind of explain that the inner part of the the condensing nebula should be hot too hot for for water or methane or carbon dioxide ice to condense and and that's why the inner solar system was the 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 nursery for the, the terrestrial-like planets, those 
that are ma mainly rock and metal. Outside the ice line, pretty much everything could condense. The, the, the metals, the rocks, the, and, and all the, guy, the gases, maybe not uh, helium or something like that or neon, but they would be, those two would be accreted in, in the forming planets in, in other ways. So you would get uh, asteroids in the center, comets outside this. The comets would be mostly outside on the, out part of the outside part of the solar system. And then when when the the end stages started coming together for the formation of the planets, um, because they're so far out, any kind of gravitational adjustment in the orbits would sling them even further out. And and there's there's very strong evidence that uh, in the later stage of solar system formation, there was a big rearrangement. And, and, and this is probably the rearrangement that led to a lot of comets hitting the Earth the forming, that gave us the water in the oceans, where Jupiter actually moved inwards to its current position in the solar system, and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune moved outwards. And, and they scattered uh, the, the comets and the protoplanets that had formed just beyond Jupiter's orbit outward to form the, the Kuiper belt, uh, the, the belt where between 30 and 50 AU where the, the um, uh, where Pluto resides and, and uh, 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 Erikoth, as Paul mentioned earlier. And, and th there, there are very, very different flavors of Kuiper belt objects, which are interesting. Um, but for, for the purposes here, a lot of material is thrown in, into the outer part of the Oort cloud. And because there's already stuff scattered throughout the, the distant solar system, a lot of it is thrown completely out of the solar system. And it, it's lost from the solar system because the further out you go, the weaker the gravitational binding energy is. In fact, the Oort cloud extends uh, to uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 AU from, from the sun. And it, at those distances, the gravitational binding energy is really, really tiny. Uh, it takes only like a kilometer per second kick uh, to eject something from that region that it is still bound to the sun to, to the interstellar medium where it's not bound to the sun. And, and the, the current idea is that most uh, planetary systems that are forming, that, are, that form around stars like, like our star, the sun, um, will have an Oort cloud, will have a, a uh, they, you know, it may not undergo that, that kind of particular rearrangement, but it will be scattered, will include scattered objects very far out that can then easily be ejected into the interstellar medium. Now, I'm leaving out, obviously, a lot of detail here. Um, um, some of it's not completely known, but some of it is just, you know, uh, you know details. Um, interesting, but, but not, for the, not useful for us here. So the, the first mystery... Um, Oumuamua uh, implied, just the fact that we discovered it, uh, implies that there's much more interstellar uh, uh, debris, comets and asteroids and perhaps other things, than we ever expected. Uh, probably by somewhere at least two orders of magnitude, a factor of 100, as much as 100 million times more stuff than we expected. So, so two to eight orders of magnitude, more stuff than we expected. Again, it, it, we expected to discover things in, uh, in the interstellar medium coming through our solar system. In, in fact, there were predictions of how many would be in our solar system at any given time. But just the mere fact of discovering it and then also discovering another one uh, to a uh, Borisov uh, means that there's a lot of stuff out there. And, and, and that in itself is, is very interesting because not only are you gonna have comets and asteroids out there, you're going to have other objects out there. You're going to have planetismals. You're going to have uh, objects that are maybe <clears throat> that are many moon-sized objects and maybe even planets and giant planets in the interstellar medium that are ejected from every solar system that's forming. <clears throat> but the number is kind of impressive. If you looked at just objects like Oumuamua, you'd expect that around 10 to 15 such objects are ejected from the solar system during the formation of the solar system. That's a lot of debris that, that's out there. And so this is just a, a plot showing the various models, the, 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 the inferred value for the, the number out that are out there, 10 to the 15, that's on the right here, 
is, is much higher than, than the standard models, which are the simple power law distribution of sizes of objects or, or two component or uh, modified power laws. Uh, in fact, you have to look at the most optimistic um, ejection efficiency ejection efficiency to get the kind of numbers that are out there. And and even then it's almost like cheating in a way, but it, but they're there, obviously they're there. So, so something gives, yeah, something's there. So that's one mystery. Uh, I wouldn't call it a mystery. It's one big surprise, one, one amazing discovery. The interstellar medium is just populated with lots of stuff, whatever it is. <clears throat> the, the second thing, and this is, I would put it, uh, as a surprise and as somewhat of a mystery, is that Oumuamua originated from a particular rest frame called the local standard of rest. Now, you all of you probably know that you know our sun go, orbits the center of our galaxy, and and the local neighborhood of of stars around our sun orbit pretty much together. They might be you know, distorted a little bit in their relative positions, but they, they orbit pretty much as a group um, and, and they'll stay together for you know, you know, some amount of time. Uh, <clears throat> but if you average the random velocities with each other, you'll get what's called the local standard of rest. And, and so their, their motions with regard to the local standard of rest is gonna be their sort of random motions about the, the velocity at which it, the, these objects rotate around the center of our galaxy. Um, and Oumuamua uh, originated from almost exactly that local standard of rest. In other words, it, it originated from a, a place where it's almost impossible to trace it back to its origin, its origin star or its origin location, which um, for for some people that might be paranoid, you know that that might be a, a little bit um, you know suggestive that someone didn't know, didn't want us to know where it came from. I don't think it's quite that that um, uh, um, it. Uh, it does. I don't think it quite reaches that level of importance, but we'll we'll go back to that. We'll come back to it in, in a little bit. Another thing <clears throat> that um, was a surprise and, and is a mystery, uh, and and this might even be a bigger mystery, is that you remember that the the stars in our local neighborhood they have random velocities about that local standard of rest, and if you measure the velocity of Oumuamua relative to our sun, the, the velocity is actually very, very large. It's about 26 kilometers per second. Now, remember that I said we expect most interstellar objects to be from, to be comets and to be ejected into the interstellar medium from very far out. And so it only takes like a kilometer per second for them to be ejected. Well, here we have something that was ejected with a velocity of 26 kilometers per second. Um, if our models are at all correct, and 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 this is um, this takes a, a, a lot of um, momentum change to accomplish. I mean, interactions between um, different interstellar objects or in, or objects in the Oort cloud or in the the, the Kuiper belt would just not be expected to give anything even approaching that. It's a very fast object to start with when it starts coming into our solar system. So that's another um, surprise and, and mystery. Here's another surprise and mystery. And, and this shows at the top um, plots of, its, of the brightness of Oumuamua over uh, several nights uh, at different colors, uh, different wavelength bands. And at the bottom is, a, or in the middle rather, is a model which shows the, the best fit ellipsoid that will explain that, um, uh, uh, that light curve. The, the brightness varies by more than a factor of eight, uh, actually close to a factor of 10. And um, that means uh, at first blush, that it has an aspect ratio of about 10 to 1. Um, now, we have seen solar system objects that have, you know, a 
different brightness or different reflectivity on one side versus the other one, but nothing approaching eight. Like Iapetus, um, the moon, one of the moons of Saturn, has about a difference in brightness or reflectivity about six. But we that that's because of different processes going on on, on the two surfaces. Um, here we have something that's just bizarre, and and the best interpretation is an ellipsoid that that's shaped a bit like a cigar, uh, rotating with um, a a rotation rate of at, of at least 7.3 hours, which is not that unusual for an asteroid, which you know has rotation rates about you know four to say 20 uh, hour, or rotational periods, four to 20 hours. Uh, there, are, there's a possibility that the the rotation rate could be much longer than this, but that really doesn't change the 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 nature of the mystery. Here we have an object that 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 just defies explanation for origin in in our solar system we don't of all the you know the nearly a million objects in our solar system that have been cataloged you know comets and asteroids and all the planets and moons we haven't found anything like i said earlier that has an aspect ratio of more than three to one and that you know the the few that have been seen a three to one are very small objects and and they're actually you know some evidence that there's you know more than one object that maybe two objects that came together to form them so this is weird. <laughs> so, you know, the aspect ratio has, has um, uh, really impressed a lot of people that, that this, is a, this is unusual. Um, well, a lot of unusual things about this, but that's, that's, uh, that's one of them. Now, we're not done yet. There's, there's more. Spitzer did a, a long integration at um, thermal wavelengths that about where you'd expect to be able to detect thermal emissions, uh, and there were none. They were able to set an upper limit, um, which would give us um, uh, the, both, both the, the cross-section and its um, reflectivity. So, you know, up, upper limit of its size, about 100 meters, um, which seems to suggest that the aspect ratio, uh, that and the aspect ratio suggests that it's probably 100 meters across, um, and, and maybe, um, uh, you know, near, nearly, uh, you know, five to a thousand or 500 meters in length or, or maybe a kilometer in length. It's, you know, the size of a, you know, a small battleship or something or a large battleship. Uh, the reflectivity is, is a, another uh, unusual uh, observation. Most um, asteroids have reflectivities of maybe you know, two percent, three percent, sometimes four or five percent, but Oumuamua must have a reflectivity of at least 0.2. It's very, very bright. So these can be combined in, in you know, radiative models to to show that you know it's it has an, you know, there there are possibilities. There's no unique solution, but there are possibilities for the shape to to that are consistent with the physics, with a bright object and an aspect ratio of uh, that that you know say averages you know six to eight to one something in that range you're going to see i'm going to sort of fluctuate between six to one and ten to one i i don't really know what the better um matches or the better uh con or the consensus is at this point i think i'm not sure there is a consensus but but that's it's got to be in that range somewhere now and that's okay so that's another mystery we're again we're not done now uh, Oumuamua exhibited something that's called non-gravitational acceleration. You know, most objects in our solar system are, you know, their motions are dominated by, by the force of gravity. Uh, but comets, because they emit gas from some of their surfaces, they act like rockets. That gas, you know, em emitting in one direction uh, propels the object in the other direction. Uh, equal and opposite forces, if you will, uh, Newton's third law. So uh, <clears throat> comets are known to do this. A and you might think that, well, they would just emit in random directions and it would over time just average out. Well, it doesn't work like that because the, the heating from the sun is usually on one side or one end. And, and because it's heated on one side more than the other, that means that there's more emission of gas, sublimation and rocket-like uh, action on one side than the other, and that pushes it in in a certain direction. 
And since it, the, the heating is generally on the side facing the sun, the acceleration due to this rocket is usually away from the sun, okay? And comets uh, show this, they exhibit that. That's not unusual. Asteroids don't though, okay? No, that's, that's a key point. Now, when we look at Oumuamua, what we find that even though this non-gravitational acceleration is small, it's like, um, uh, well, it's just, let me just say it's small. Over time, the, the, the change in the orbit and the change in the velocity is clearly detectable. And over a period of months, that will lead to a difference in its location of 100,000 kilometers or so. And so you can pin down that, that um, non-gravitational acceleration very precisely, or I'm just like, yeah, very, very accurately. Um, and uh, so there's clear, well, it, the, 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 there's something going on that's giving an acceleration away from the sun. Comets do this, but asteroids don't. Now, very brief detour. Comets, as you know, and I'm sure you know this, so I, I kind of apologize for this slide to begin with. Comets have a small nucleus, sort of a dirty snowball that has ice and, and rock and dirt and, and um, uh, dust. And when it gets close to the sun, that sublimates and you see the dust and you see the light scattered from the dust and, and the gas. So that's how you see the comets. You don't see the nuclei uh, when it's close to the sun and this is, this is happening when it's sublimating. Well, um, the best observations, remember the points, point observation of, um, of Oumuamua, uh, soon after its detection, the, the one that I showed early on that was you know, uh, guiding on Oumuamua, no coma, uh, no halo, no tail, and, and none of the observations showed any, anything like that. So here you got a situation where this object showed uh, acceleration away from the sun, but no coma or no gas was coming off to, to provide that acceleration. So that's a little disturbing if you believe the laws of physics. Okay, so without trying to explain all this and going into discovery theories, um, let me just check my time real quickly. Um, let me talk about uh, Q. Beresov, um, which is the, the second uh, interstellar object I was talking about. And I'm not going to go into as much detail with this one because it, it's clearly interstellar. It has an eccentricity of about 3.36. Uh, we can measure its, uh, or we can estimate the radius of the nucleus. Uh, initially, it, it was a lot of uncertainty between 1.4 and 16 kilometer radius. Now it's down to one kilometer or maybe a little bit less. Um, it, we have its rotation rate. And it's clearly outgassing gases that we'd expect, like carbon uh, or CN. Um, and I'll mention a couple more maybe in a minute. It has um, uh, a, a hyperbolic orbit that we can, you know, we can track back to, to the direction it came from. It did not come from the local uh, standard of rest. Um, the, the composition is... It, it, is determinable because we see C2 and CN and, and like we see for uh, carbon depleted comets, um, we see we've observed in NH2 bands and O and OH hydroxyl that is, uh, that is there because water breaks up. So there's water that's outgassed. All the things that you would expect, maybe C2 is not quite as you would expect, but, but generally all the things that you would expect um, for outgassing and we saw uh, uh, non-gravitational acceleration that is consistent with this um, and and even as this object got close to the sun it broke apart uh, maybe not completely disturbed but it, it broke apart pieces fragmented off and they then too evaporated when it got uh, within two AUs of the sun I mean clearly a, a comet um, in, in terms of where they came from, again, both clearly hyperbolic orbits, um, they, they came from out of the, the plane of the ecliptic, um, both came in the intersolar system and, and near Earth, which that's not a mystery because 
those are about the only ones that we can detect at this point, something that clo comes close to the Earth. Um, and, and so the, they're, they're two objects that are both interstellar, but they're vastly different. Okay. So, you know, you could, you know, the question of whether or not to Borisov is a comet it is, is really not a question. It's spherical. There's no indication of the unusual shape. There's outgassing and dust and, and the gases or the ices there that you'd expect. Um, Oumuamu, on the other hand, an unusual, highly unusual shape, aspect ratio like a cigar, a high reflectivity albedo, no outgassing, no dust, and yet you see a non-gravitational acceleration. Uh, and as I said earlier, and I threw this in just to remind myself to say this, that most ejected interstellar objects are expected to be comets by probably a factor of a thousand to one. The fact that we see something that's not like a comet, that by itself is a surprise too. Um, okay. So now then let me get into origin theories and then, then I'll wrap up here. Uh, again, they're not. I'm not going to go into all of them. One is... And, and the, the origin theories purport to explain the, the unusual nature of Oumuamua. In fact, the things we do not see, that's what the, the origin theories uh, are trying to explain, the things we don't see. So if you remember, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 um, had a near encounter with Jupiter in 1992, and which broke it up into about a dozen pieces, and which then came back around and hit Jupiter uh, in 1994 in, in you know, a sequence of, of uh, impacts in Jupiter's atmosphere that were seen with um, the Hubble Space Telescope. Both the plumes and, and the, the scars in the atmosphere were seen. So dis disruption, and the point here is that, that you know, comets and asteroids that get close to a giant planet are broken up. If they get inside the Roche limit, then the, the tidal forces on the object will just break them apart. Unless it's something really coherent, like, like, like a metal, something that has a really high tensile strength. So the, the initial view of how Oumuamua was formed was something like this. I won't, I'm not sure if this was the initial view or one of the first ones that came out. So in the late stages of solar system formation, you had a planetismal that uh, got too close to Jupiter and it was fragmented. But instead of then um, coming back around and, and, int and colliding with this giant planet, they were ejected in the into the interstellar medium. And they stayed in the interstellar medium for a long time. Uh, you know, cosmic rays, uh, you know, interacted with, the stuff on the surface to turn it red. If you have galactic cosmic rays or even solar ultraviolet radiation, it'll change methane into a reddish um, amorphous type stuff called uh, tholins. Um, and, and you might even you know, argue that you could get an unusual, unusual shape this way, but not 10 to one. Okay, There's, you know, this, there are problems with this. It, you know, the shape's not right. The fact that there's no outgassing the the implied interstellar number being so high and the then the the reflectivity still doesn't explain everything another theory a molecular hydrogen iceberg and i was really surprised when i saw this i just said how in the world could you get something like that well the the idea here is that uh the the authors uh want to explain the non-gravitational acceleration with something you can't see and, and so they, they suggested that maybe it's made up of molecular hydrogen ice and this is sublimating and you can't really see molecular hydrogen ice. And if there's no dust to be carried off and it's just molecular hydrogen ice, you won't see the, the halo or the, 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 the uh, tail that comes off. Um, and, 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 and the problem here, um, the, the central problem is the with this theory is the the formation mechanism and and the author suggested that you could get an h2 rich body forming in the coldest part of a giant molecular cloud again where the temperatures are just a few degrees kelvin and the number density of hydrogen is maybe 10 to the 5 per cubic centimeter by um, hydrodynamic collapse and then what happened was after that the authors proposed that this thing traveled in the interstellar medium until it 
uh, and it aged by cosmic rays and changed colors until it hit the solar system. I I just have a hard time buying it. Uh, first of all, to get the right shape, the authors have models that they show where you can go from, a, you know, a giant molecular cloud condensing to, I'm sorry, they don't explain that specifically. They show how you can start off with an iceberg that's in the interstellar medium and that it can have moderate elongation. And then as it is subjected to cosmic rays, it will become more elongated. And by the time it gets to our solar system, the um, evaporation of stuff would make it have an aspect ratio like a cigar. The formation process is really, it's really problematic. And, and getting the shape right implies really serious tuning and, and um, optimistic things about the model. So it, it's not a very satisfactory model. And I'm not sure I know anyone other than the authors who really tried to defend it. Now, there's a really good article that I, I will, that I suggest, if you're interested in this, that I would suggest you read, because it sort of summarizes what was known up until July of 2019 about um, how you could, you know, and there were six different major theories at the time. Uh, and and most of them have some flavor of what I've already talked about, either disruption or evaporation or ejection from a solar system or preferential sublimation on one side or the other and so on. But you can look this up if, if you like. This is um, uh, this was um, uh, published in, you know, like I said, um, uh, in, in a few year, a few years ago in Nature Astronomy. So uh, this is a more recent um theory, which is a lot more detailed. And, and this is where it, it uh, uh, overlaps my own research and got me seriously interested in, in this. And, and that is a possibility that's, that the, the thing originated as a collisional fragment from a Kuiper belt object. Yeah. And this is, you know, Pluto, it's a Kuiper belt object. Pluto and Chiron, its big moon, and its four Ooh. small moons were um, formed from a collision between two Kuiper belt objects, which threw stuff into space. Some of it uh, ended up accreting to form uh, Charon, and some pieces didn't accrete, and that's what we got the small moons. Uh, Triton, uh, the large moon of Neptune, uh, is, is almost certainly a Kuiper belt object. Neptune probably had two of these early on. Maybe Pluto was one of them. And uh, we suspect that that Triton was captured because it is in a retrograde orbit uh, that is highly inclined around Neptune. There are no other large moons that we know of in our solar system that have retrograde orbits like that. So there's a collision involved there too. Collisions in, in early uh, solar system, among early solar system objects in the Kuiper Belt were probably very, very common. Um, and and that would lead to a lot of fragments going into to space. Now, if you look at both of these objects, what you see is that there's a lot of bright stuff and a lot of dark stuff. The bright stuff is nitrogen ice, N2 ice. There are glaciers of N2 ice, 10 kilometers thick, maybe some places much thicker than that. And collisions will, will fragment that and send those fragments into space along with a lot of the other stuff that sent into space in, in, the, in the collision. So the, the idea here, uh, and this was published by author Steve Desch and, and uh, A.P. Jackson, I don't know him. And, and they suggest that a collision with a Kuiper belt, um, between a Kuiper belt object in another solar system and another Kuiper belt object uh, uh, ejected a large number of these ice fragments, about half of them being water and the other half being into ice. And, and these are, a lot of these are ejected into the interstellar medium because of the same kind of instabilities that happen in our solar system when the planets rearranged. But we don't know if all planetary systems do that. Cosmic rays will erode them so that you can start out maybe with a two to one ellipsoid and end up with maybe a six to one ellipsoid. Um, kind of hard, you kind of have to tune the models to get um, something like that happening. But they have a detailed model which show that you can start off with um, at the bottom here, 92 meter by 91 meter by 54 meter into fragment. 
And over uh, half a billion years, or nearly a half a billion years, it would um, erode to 45 by 44, 7.5 uh, objects, which is consistent with what uh, we saw for Oumuamua uh, uh, near a pair, or a little bit after a perihelion. Um, so it takes a lot of tuning to get this. I mean, like this, you have another solar system forming like ours about 400 million years ago um, because that solar system underwent some rearrangements like our solar system done. And Paul, I'm almost done here. Sorry, I'm going so long. Um, and this it was ejected from that solar system. It spent this time in the interstellar medium, be, interstellar medium being eroded by cosmic rays. Uh, it came into our solar system, was ablated even more, and we don't see the the um, uh, the halo or the tail because it's in two ice or that's sublimating. The water ice ones don't work because you will see the you would see the water or the OH, and it can't have dust in it, so you can't have a dust halo. So this is a, a an interesting, a very complex. Um, theory. It's a, and it, it predicts that, that, that you would have around 10 to the 14 of these objects ejected from every forming solar, solar system. Uh, again, that's going to mean a lot of interstellar junk out there. So interesting, but I, I, you know, no pun intended, interesting, but no cigar, as they say. So uh, along comes uh, uh, Avi Lieb and uh, his colleague, Shmuel Bailey. And they said, well, you know, this thing is so peculiar. We, we, we need to, to consider, you know, other possible uh, origins. Um, you know, this thing is unusual in shape. The, uh, the local, it originated in the local standard of rest, uh, has a very high velocity relative to the sun. Uh, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, you know, the aspect ratio and the and the highly reflectivity and the non-gravitational acceleration are really a combination of very bizarre things. One or two of these, you might say that we could explain them with unusual things, but so many of these. And so what they suggested, uh, well, based upon, they, they actually did a, a search at radio wavelengths using a radio telescope to see if there was any radio emissions and they, from this object and there were none. So they suggested that this was a broken piece of technology. And when I first heard this, I thought, well, maybe they're thinking about a broken rocket, um, you know, shaped like a battleship again. Uh, but what they're really thinking about is uh, something like a solar sail, sail, something that we've proposed, you know, humans have proposed to, to carry us from one solar system to another, you know, using a light sail, using the momentum and light to to um, to sail among the stars, and it, it it requires a very very thin, only a few molecules thin uh, sheet of material that is uh, you know many kilometers in size. It's really reflective, the kind of thing you would expect. And if it's broken and it's sort of tumbling in space, like we see this thing sort of tumbling, then this might be you know the kind of thing that you um, that you um, um, uh, you know, you could conceive of. And um, uh, Lieb is a very interesting fellow. And so he even quotes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in one of his um, uh, writings. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the, the truth. I'm sorry, I actually mistyped that. Once you eliminate the possible. So any, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, this is a broken piece of technology. And, or a, a reconnaissance probe um, uh, of our solar system uh, that was launched by the, the at the local uh, standard of rest to disguise its source star. Or perhaps it's a buoy that's sort of floating uh, in the uh, local standard of rest that carries it around the center of the galaxy. And there are lots of these buoys that are maybe navigational devices. Anyhow. Interesting, very interesting, and and um, I I applaud the the people for having the the guts to to propose something like this because I think we should in, entertain these kind of ideas. Um, uh, but okay, you know, what do the observations tell us? Well, it's clearly unexplained 
things here, um, things we don't understand. Uh, the the one thing that 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 tells me that that the interstellar tech a broken technology idea um, tells me is that if if this is true, then the interstellar medium must be just absolutely loaded, saturated with interstellar junk. That's technology junk. Uh, probably as many pieces of interstellar technology junk as there are interstellar asteroids and comets. If it's a random directed reconnaissance probe, then each planet in the civilization would have to launch maybe 10 to the 15 probes like that. Um, and, and if it's a directed probe, then this would have to be launched many hundreds of years ago before we were a spacefaring race and it wasn't even clear that we would get to be a spacefaring race. I guess maybe they, the people or the entities that were launching us were more optimistic or whatever. So we don't know. Um, we have a couple of things coming up. The Large Synoptic Survey the Telescope. Oh, here's the, the, the figure I was going to show you a minute ago, just to illustrate how it, dim it's getting. This is the, the, the V mag, uh, magnitude uh, as a function of uh, date. Uh, it, it got between 19 and 20 visual magnitude uh, at perihelion or close to perihelion. And now it's um, you know at 34, so it, it's it's a challenge to see the large, large synoptic uh, the large synoptic survey telescope, which is now called the Verisi Rubin Telescope, will be able to see it, um, and um, uh, it it will probably although it'll be a difficult thing for it to see. But the the thing here is that this this facility is going to scan the entire sky with an 8.5 aperture telescope and a three gigabyte CCD and it's going to take large images of this of the sky so that it will um, survey the whole sky every three days you know terabytes of data every day and so it should discover thousands of of, of well supernova comets and asteroids and and it you know if these numbers are right it should easily discover interstellar objects every um, month or two, or or maybe even more frequently than that. So that's going to come. You know, it's going to have new lights. Sorry, buddy. Sorry, it's going to have first light in in less than a year. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there are studies of how you would catch up with these in a spacecraft, which would be you know very interesting thing to do if one came in that was as unusual as uh, Oumuamua, and. Uh, uh, it would take a very large rocket to do that, and the payload would probably have to be very small, something like a CubeSat. But there are studies that are that are doing that. Probably a better idea would to put um, a spacecraft in in a parking orbit around the Earth or the Moon or an L one or um, a, uh, a gravitational stable point in an Earth Moon system or maybe somewhere else. And then once we see one, an interstellar object coming in, then launch it from there so that we would start going towards it before perihelion. And, and then um, uh, there might even be another uh, possibility with so many of these things coming through the solar system. And if the numbers we infer are correct, there should be one in the inner solar system closer to the sun than the earth is right now, another one. And there should be many of them coming through our solar system at any given point. And so these sh should be detectable, uh, but a few of these, maybe it's only a tiny number, uh, would be uh, captured by giant planets. Jupiter should have captured some of these in, in its history. And they should be in orbits around Jupiter that are clearly unusual orbits. And so maybe, you know, if we could study those more carefully, we could go and find one that has been captured uh, already. So I'm going to stop here. And again, my apologies for. No, that's okay. That's, um, that's super. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm working on a, a project with some students related to this. And um, um, there are all sorts of implications all over the place for if if this is if these numbers for this thing is correct so uh, like, well, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the presentation to give you back the screen 
And so you are now in charge again. Okay. What a cool, what a cool object, uh, Michael. Thank you for uh, sharing all that. And it's even more interesting, the fact that it's got you guys stumped. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't often find something with so many different aspects of it that fall into the, uh, you know, improbable category, as, as you mm -hmm. said. So um, really interesting. I, I've got, I'll just start with one question. Then we have a few in the chat room. You mentioned the LSST scope could still see it, but they're not they're not coming online right until next year sometime. Well, I, um, let me clarify that. The Vera Rubin telescope will, will routinely see down to 24th magnitude. Right now it's at 34. So seeing or well, Mu is probably not going to happen okay. with the telescope. Uh, probably not with any telescope at this point. Uh, but it was discovered at about a visual magnitude of 19. And so uh, the Vera Rubin telescope should be able to see it easily, you know, uh, if it can go down to 24. And if they're even closer to the sun, it should be able to find them quite okay. often. I mean, these were very close to the Earth. Uh, and that's the only reason we, we were able to, de you know, detect these. Um, so I know, Scott, you raised your hand. Apologize we didn't catch you at the, at the time. But did you, uh, did you want to ask your question? If Scott's still on, if not, um, Jimmy Knapp, you had a question about gra gravitational force. Yeah, the way uh, it was spinning, I was curious to find out if there was, uh, it, you know, what the gravity would be like on that object. Uh, that's actually an interesting question. Um, it's spinning at just about as fast as it can go without... Uh, breaking apart if it was a rock or if it was rocky comet-like material. Uh, again, comets, you know, the standard model is ice and, and rock, the dirty snowball model. A standard cometary uh, makeup is just barely possible given its rotation speed. Um, so um, what is gravity like? Well, that tells you that, you know, you, you could jump off of it. <laughs> you know, it's pretty weak. Now, if it's made of metal, then there's no problem or, or something that has been annealed over time by cosmic rays, then it's not nearly as problematic. But even so, if it was annealed by cosmic rays, if, say if it was ice, then cosmic rays sort of, you know, interact with the surface to maybe over time, uh, chemically alter the surface, cause it to be more sticky. The fact that it came through the inner solar system and heated up and that stuff didn't fracture to give you ice or anything underneath it, I, I think that that's kind of, a, kind of a stretch, but we don't know. I mean, we don't know what the makeup is. And so you're left with a lot of tunable parameters. I can't, re I can't really give you a good answer, sorry. Is it spinning around a, a single axis or is it tumbling? It's tumbling. Uh, in fact, it's at, at very close to the highest possible excitation rate. Cool. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. Um, David, David Worth, you had a question on spectroscopy. Uh, if you've already addressed this, Mike, I apologize, but I was just wondering if any spectroscopy has been done on the object, did we know what the uh, makeup of it was? Um, it, it, there's been plenty of attempts to detect this, you know, all the standard things that you see coming out of comets, like uh, OH or NH2 or, or C2 or CN or HCN or, or all sorts of other things. No, uh, in fact, not only has have no chemicals been, been detected, uh, no coma and no tail has been detected. And the object itself, even though it's been seen visually, it shows only a tendency towards a reddish end of the spectrum as opposed to any kind of clear identifiable spectroscopic feature on the surface. Um, now, if you look at certain classes of comets, like comets that are long period comets that come in from the, the Oort cloud that have been out there for billions of years, they tend to be reddish as well. If you just take methane, uh, an ice, you know, methane ice and subject it to cosmic ray uh, hits for for you know hundreds of millions of years, it becomes reddish because the 
the carbon hydrogen bonds are broken. Some of the hydrogen is kicked off and, and the carbons tend to stick together to form polymers, but it's not a single polymer. It, it, it becomes an amorphous mass that, that tends to reflect uh, the, the reddish part of the spectrum. Um, and, and so it, it, it doesn't have a single, if, if that's what it is, you know, there, there is no clear spectroscopic signature other than just general a reddish uh, aspect to it. Thank you. Okay. But there have, been, there have been plenty of attempts to try to get composition of, of any gas or any dust or, you know, even the object itself. No successes that I'm aware of. Hey, uh, Alan, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, Mike. Um, if um, if these have been percolating and passing through the solar system continuously for a long time, and Jupiter is potentially such a magnet, mm -hmm. wouldn't the fact that we haven't seen any from the spacecraft around Jupiter, either directly or indirectly, put an upper limit mm -hmm. uh, that might be different from the one event? Right. The statistics of one event gives you the median density estimate. Yeah. But that means it's half as likely to be above and half as likely to be below. Right. Yeah. No, no, an interesting question. And and you know, I I and others have have you know tried to make some sense of this. The the first thing you gotta struggle with is the fact that these things are moving very fast. And it's hard for Jupiter to capture an object. Um that's coming in at any kind of velocity like this. It'll just be a hyperbolic orbit around Jupiter. So somehow, you know, the object that's coming in has to lose a lot of momentum. Maybe it has to collide with another object, or maybe um, there's an interaction with the, a resonance or something where it goes into a very elongated orbit. But you should be able to just look at the population of, of objects that's orbiting Jupiter and see any that have um, highly inclined orbits or maybe retrograde orbits um, or that have unusual um, spect well unusual aspects to them, maybe aspect ratio. Uh, none have been seen, but it's hard to capture them. And so it's only going to be a tiny fraction. And when I say tiny, I'm talking about 10 to the minus 5, something like that. Um, uh, the, but but there are a couple of objects that that might that have been looked at that might be captured interstellar objects, but it's not a slam dunk. But you are right; it should set an upper limit, but the upper limit is going to be pretty small. Okay, um, I will go to Milan Mijak. Sorry if I got your name wrong, but I ask your question. Milan's there. If <clears throat> my microphone. Okay. Uh, uh, so the object, the Oumuamua, was observed for a very short time. Uh, so is it possible that its uh, cigar shape may be faked if it is a binary asteroid mm -hmm. with the tidally locked components? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh you know, we have some experience with binary objects, um, even objects that are touching each other, you know, so close. But mm -hmm. Erakoth was one of those, for instance, two protoplanets that were just sticking together. And and they have very distinctive rotational uh, light curves. Uh, if they're not touching, if they're close together, they have distinctive light curves. This doesn't have that, that nature. This has a very simple rotational light curve, which is like I showed you, which is best fit by uh, a, an elongated ellipsoid, not by two objects touching. Now, could you fake it? Yeah, possibly. If you had two objects that were like cylinders with those kind of aspect ratios that you were sticking together with the right shape, I don't know why anyone would want to fake it, but um, you know, it, it, people have tried really hard to come up with mm. other shapes and and as I kind of hinted earlier, you know, you might think that, well, maybe it's possible that it's an object that's eight times or 10 mm -hmm. times brighter on one side than the other. Um, Iapetus is a moon like that, but Iapetus is understood. You know, it's had 
you know, hundreds of millions of years of being hit by Saturn's magnetosphere on one side and, and objects and, and particles from Enceladus. And so that's not the kind of thing that would happen in the intracellular medium. So how do you, how would you get a brightness difference like that? And and then it's it's not just that brightness difference. It would have to be a brightness difference where the rotational axis is always perpendicular to you as it goes through the solar system. So it just doesn't work. Um, so anyhow, it's a, it's a, it was it was a, it's an interesting idea, but we just can't get it to work. Thank you. Okay, hey, we'll go to Barbara. Barbara Cook. <clears throat> I think we have I think we have a couple more here, but uh, we'll give Barbara a chance. And uh, anyone else have a question? We can you can type it in the chat box, or just or just ask it. Uh, um, Barbara was Barbara was looking for more like a practical. Uh, um, oh, given given you said it was shiny, is there a, is there a kind of a real world example of what that would be like? Um, I guess you said it was twenty percent, twenty percent, right? Reflectivity, yeah. Well, What's a that, real world example? That's still well. That's pretty bright. The Earth is twenty twenty eight. Okay. The Earth is pretty bright. It's brighter than the Moon. Yeah. What's the, what's the Moon? I what? someone have to look it up, but I believe it's like less than ten percent. This is a bright object. It would be like corrugated steel that's not rusted. Okay. Did don't, we just... don't don't quote me as saying I'm saying it's made out of steel. Okay. But but it's got to be something bright, and not only bright, but it's got to be sort of convoluted to explain the, the variance in the light curve. Did we just get so totally unlucky with the geometry of how this thing came through that, that we were so limited in data or would we have had a, had a better chance if it had been, you know, before perihelion or, or, uh, you know, what, what was our luck factor on this encounter? Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I think we have good observations of the light curve. I think we have good upper limits to its thermal emission, uh, lower limits to its reflectivity. I think we have good limits on its on its shape, on, on um, how much gas and dust it emits. I think we have good limits on these things. Okay. This object is just weird. Okay. Um, anyone else? John said the moon's 12%. So Yeah, so it's, it's you know this is you know almost twice as bright as the the moon. It's, it's a bright object. Yeah. Considering its size, I think. Well, even if you look at other asteroids uh, that are out there of the same size, you know the typical reflectivities are like 2 to 3 4%. So even compared to other things, the same size, this thing is bright. Okay, one other question from, uh, is it Bran Branislav? Yeah, Branislav, yeah. Branislav. Uh, I have a question, Mike, about this uh, measurement of non-gravitational acceleration. So given a very short period of time uh, that we had to observe it and the fact that the object was very faint, I mean, like, what is the margin of error that we can claim that there was uh, any non-gravitational acceleration? I mean, they detected supposedly that it was, you know, leaving, that it was not slowing down as expected due to gravity. But, you know, what is the margin of error? Are we sure about that? Yeah. Uh, see, the thing is, we, we don't measure the acceleration directly. What we measure is its position. And the position is, a, uh, that is a measure of how much acceleration it's had over a long period of time. And when, when you, you, know, you, you know where it is, and you know where it should be if it didn't have gravitational acceleration, and, and those two positions differ by 100,000 kilometers, when the, 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 the positional accuracy might be 100 kilometers, you know, that's like one in 100 uncertainty. I mean, I'm, I'm 
playing with the numbers here, but it, it's a small uncertainty in terms of the position. And so, yeah, it's real. The non-gravitational acceleration is, is unambiguous. Well, that's for me, this is the greatest mystery, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> again, comets exhibit it, but you see the stuff that's coming out. Yeah. You yeah. see the gas and dust. Here you see nothing coming out. That's so why the be, mystery, yeah. Yeah, so it has to be something coming out that's invisible. And so the models or the origin scenarios all purport an invisible propellant. And yeah. maybe that's possible. Well, it is possible. I'm not sure it's plausible. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very, very cool. Um, anyone else on... Uh, for Michael, I do want to get back to uh, a final, possibly a final question would be uh, any update on New Horizons that you can give us. Hopefully there's something oh, yeah. to chase, so, but I don't so, know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we launched this thing in 2006. We, we, we had an encounter with Jupiter that was, you know, incredibly successful a year later. We got to Pluto, had an incredible encounter 2015. We had Arakoth, January 1st, 2019. And it's now, you know, uh, over 40 AU from the sun. And the spacecraft is in perfect health. All the instruments are still working. It still has propellant. Um, and so we could look at things. The problem is finding something that we can look at out there. Now, they're, they're, we're, we're looking at well, others. I'm not involved in this part of it. Others are looking uh, at distant objects, distant KBOs, um, looking at things like the phase function, um, you know, the reflectivity as a function of solar uh, incident angle, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and there are other things like um, using uh, the, the baseline of its orbit as to get parallax of stars. And th there's lots of interesting astrophysical type things. And there's some looking for um, halos or atmospheres around Kuiper Belt objects, but they're all very distant. Ideally, you know, we'd find um, another Kuiper Belt object that is somewhere, somewhat along its path so that we could do a Delta V to fly by it. And it wouldn't even have to be a real close flyby, but we, it's just really hard to find something that far away that is a good candidate. And we haven't, as far as I know, uh, we haven't. I'm not involved in that search. Okay. Well, very cool. Any last calls? We'll go around real quick. Um, super, super great having you, Michael. Uh, um, appreciate it. I know you had a long drive today to get back here. And yeah, uh, Yesterday and today, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so really appreciate your time for spending, you know, a little bit over here, actually almost 20 minutes, which is, which is fantastic for us. So, um, we really appreciate it. And, uh, we look forward to seeing you out on, on some of our observing activities and, and, uh, and look forward to seeing you back at, uh, G GMU when we can get there ourselves. So yeah, when I can get there. <laughs> yeah. So thanks. Thanks everyone. And, uh, I did, have one, I did have one correction before everyone dials off here. We, I uh, messed up the, uh, the date for the uh, imaging group. It's actually this month, July, uh, June 19th, not July. So I chatted that in the box here, but uh, uh, hopefully you guys uh, that are interested in that will pick that up and Kevin will be emailing all of us. So uh, we have that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good night. Okay. Good night, everyone.